2019 and people with disabilities. Uh, we're joined by the presenter today, Timothy Valier, who is RPN and owner of Integrity Care Consultants. Um, my name is John Wassa. I'm the Independent Living Skills Coordinator at the Center for Independent Living in Toronto. I go by the pronouns of he and him. Uh, just to describe myself, I'm a white male with short black hair, a short black mustache. Um, I'm a person with a physical disability. Um, I use a power wheelchair and I have complex care needs. Um, I'm also joined today by my colleagues, Rebecca Wood, who is the peer and parenting coordinator, my senior manager, David Myers, and Lisa DeBona from the direct funding program, and she's the manager of that program. So although this um, webinar is happening virtually, um, SILT would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather, gather is the territory of the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory was the subject of the dish with one spoon, wampum belt covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and the Allied Nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Mm. This territory is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and on this territory. And I just wanna check in with ASL and captioning, everything okay? Excellent. So uh, workshop guidelines. Uh, we will be recording the Zoom workshop and the questions and answers section. So we can share it with people with disabilities and our allies. The workshop is content heavy, but it's meant to empower you with information and resources. For privacy and time management, everyone will be, everyone will be muted and no video except for the host. Um, if you have a specific question or comment, for the facilitators, please ensure you type it in the chat box and Rebecca Wood, a SILT staff, will ask it during the question and answer section. Your question and comment will be anonymous in the final recording. If you need support, please also select Rebecca Wood in the chat box and she will assist you. We wanna create, we want to co-create a space that everyone will feel heard and respected. And we reserve the right to remove anyone from that webinar who does not follow these guidelines that we've just outlined. So the workshop agenda, we've just done the, the welcome line acknowledgement and we will do the introductions, which takes about five minutes. I just did the workshop guidelines. We will go through the workshop objectives, have questions and answers, and finally, resources, evaluations, and thank yous. So a workshop disclaimer. This PowerPoint presentation is for general information purposes uh, only. The information is current as of March 22nd, today, 2021. The information given is subject to change depending on possible policy, regulation, and law changes. In Ontario. For the most current information, participants should check the Government of Ontario websites and other uh, websites mentioned in the presentation. This presentation is the property of Timothy Valier, uh, the owner of Integrity Care Consultants, 
and neither whole or part is to be circulated without his express consent. And his contact number is 905-895-0842. And this workshop is based on Ontario IPAC practices. So the objectives today, it's to talk about the importance of infection control. As we know, um, we are in a third wave. And I mean, the importance of infection control is really um, what we're here for today. And the routine practices to prevent infections, what causes and how to prevent the flu and COVID-19, the importance of personal protective equipment or PPE for short, and the different types of PPE and how to use it properly. Then we'll have questions and answers. Uh, we've uh, received a lot of questions during registration and you could also put questions in the chat and then we'll give out um, resources or talk about the resources. So a little bit about the Center for Independent Living in Toronto, we are rooted and then nothing about us without us disability rights movement. So it is a community-based resource center run by people with disabilities for people with disabilities. We work towards building a society where people with disabilities have social and economic equity. Our core programs assist people with disabilities to take control over their lives and to live independently in the community. Our John? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, it's Rebecca. Yes. Um, I am seeing that some people who need ASL interpretation are not seeing the videos. Um, so I'm just wondering, Rayhan, if you could pin or spotlight the interpreters and then we can just check to make sure that everyone who needs the interpreters is able to see them. So I can try putting the spotlight for everyone on. Let's see this. I could even share my video. That is working, but it takes the video away from the presenter, I think, right? The other option um, is if anyone who needs ASL and is not able to see them, um, I will promote you to a panelist and that way we can be sure that you can see all of the videos available. I think, well, the best way would be like if people, I think, go up on the top of their screen, there's a side-by-side -side mode option from the view options. That would let everybody see all the video. I, I had, oh, um, I had feedback that you can't change the view to speaker and gallery um, in webinar, but while you had them spotlit, they were able to be seen. Okay, okay. Let me see. So I have spotlight Kate as the interpreter for now. And do we need to spotlight the and, Yeah, Rehan, if you spotlight both Sean, me, and the speaker, then we should be able to control it with the cameras. Okay. So I've now added all three as the spotlight. Um, I guess, John, then you can continue. That sounds great. And um, Rehan, I will let you know if uh, there's any issue. Sure, thanks. Thank you. Um, so just getting back to uh, some of the still core programs, it's information and referral uh, and a volunteer program. 
peer support and a hurting with a disability network, my program, the independent living skills training program. We also have the attendant service application center uh, and the direct funding program. So firmly believes in the independent living philosophy where people with disabilities uh, are seen as consumers who have the right to examine choices, make decisions, take risks, make mistakes, and take responsibility for one's own life. Um, and a brief introduction about for, for our, our main speaker today, Timothy Valier. He's the owner and president of Integrity Care Consultants and is an RPN who started his health career in 1979. He is a healthcare educator. He is a president of the Integrity Care Consultants. He's a care consultant specializing in care and services for uh, physically disabled adults and seniors, operational use, education development, sales and marketing and workshop facilitation provincially and internationally. He's also an educator at York Region District School Board, a personal support worker, program development and teacher and clinical preceptor. And he is an RPN at Emily House and Philip Aziz Center Pediatric Hospice. Uh, so I'll pass it to Tim. Awesome, thanks so much, John. So welcome everybody. Thanks for coming and hanging out on this beautiful day. Um, today we're going to be talking Hello, about- Tim. Yeah. Hi, so this is the interpreter interrupt. It seems that we're still having some problems being uh, viewed uh, oh. by the persons wishing to access ASL and I'm not sure um, how to alleviate that, but we're I, I'm that. what I'm okay. Now the person is saying they see both Tim and Sean. I believe it's an issue with speaker view versus gallery view. So as soon as you stop talking, Sean, um, it disappears. Uh, and then as soon as I start speaking, I reappear. So if the person is able to switch the view, um, that will alleviate the issue, if not, what I'm going to do is promote anyone who needs ASL interpretation as a panelist, and then they'll be able to see um, everyone for sure. So Rebecca, just to let you know, the issue with that now is, is that when I was, when you did start speaking, I did disappear. So the person would not see the interpretation of what you just said. It's sort of a <laughs> correct chasing our tail kind of thing. What I'm going to do is put some information in the chat so that we're all communicating together. Thank you. And I think the box is on me, so maybe if I interpret that now. I apologize, it's just taking me a moment to find the person. There we go. Okay, we can do a little test to make sure that it's working. There we go. Yes, thank you. We can continue. Awesome. One second. Oh. Okay, here we go. So we're going to be talking about infection prevention and control, or IPAC for short, and really what the main goal is to prevent or reduce the risk of transmitting microorganisms or germs to staff and others. 
the big word is prevention. And what we always want to try to do is operate from a minimal risk and predictable outcome philosophy. And that's based on some form of risk assessment. So given COVID-19, our risk assessment is ever evolving, as is all of the findings from the, the research being done currently. So it's an ongoing process. So we need to always be diligent um, that we're, we're mindful of what potentially is going to change by checking the government websites. Next slide. Well, some statistics when we talk about IPAC. So of the nearly 56.9 million deaths worldwide, and this is from the World Health Organization, and their stats are usually about five years old, okay? Because it takes time to collate everything and then publish it. So infectious diseases account for more than 17 million or one in three deaths worldwide. For example, 3 million people died from respiratory infections alone in 2016. So according to the WHO, there are about 1 billion people annually who get the flu. The WHO estimates that 290,000 to 650,000 people die of flu-related causes every single year, hence why we always encourage people to take their flu shot. Flu causes in Canada about 12,200 hospitalizations and 3,500 deaths every year. So if we look at the flu, talking about a billion, and we go to where John Hopkins statistics are for um, March 17th, John updated this, thank you, John, 120,799,704 COVID-19 cases and 2.6 million deaths worldwide. Canada alone is closing in on a million COVID-19 cases and 22, 5,000 deaths. Next slide. So when we talk about IPAC, what we want to do is reduce the risk of transmitting germs. You want to reduce to yourself, your attendants, your family, your friends, our broader community, and others around us in the world. So what is a microbe or a, a simple word is just to call everything a germ. It just makes it nice and layman terms. Uh, some germs are harmful and those germs are called pathogens and others that are not harmful are called non-pathogens. So the basic four types that we look at are bacteria, which are one-celled microbes, viruses that need to invade a living cell so that they can grow and multiply, Fungi, which are organic matters such as plants or animals, so fungal type of infections, and then parasites that live uh, and nourish off of their host, tapeworms, for example. So if we think about it so that we don't get so scared, and everybody's scared of COVID-19, I understand that. Um, as a healthcare worker and working on the front line, I, I totally understand how people feel. So a typical person's hands can carry 10,000 to 10 million microorganisms. We have some resident microorganisms and we have some transient microorganisms. The resident ones are supposed to be there. They help to protect us. Transient ones are not supposed to be there. Those are the ones that can easily get into our body via our mucous membranes. So Good thing is they're easy to remove by proper hand hygiene. So we're going to watch some videos about hand hygiene and personal protective equipment. And then I'm also going to talk you through um, proper way to do that if you're visually impaired. So hopefully my explanation will be simple. And then there are some images for people who are more visual types of, of learners. The important thing to remember is that some people show no symptoms. So they're asymptomatic, they're in an incubation period. So the, incubation period we typically look at is 48 to 72 hours before somebody is, shows symptoms and the same after the somebody has resolved their symptoms. Next slide. So I like to use images when I'm, I'm talking and teaching and it just makes it easier for me um, as a learner as well. So what I like um, is this is an old bit of information from the World Health Organization, but they look at um, viruses uh, and bacteria and our immune system sort of like a game of baseball. So if we think of a virus, it would be the size of the baseball. If we think of a bacteria, the bacteria would be the size of the pitcher's mound. 
and the entire baseball field would be your own immune system. So if you have a strong immune system and you look after yourself, we try to eat properly, rest properly, drink enough water, make sure we exercise, try to de-stress. I know that seems really difficult in this year that we have, are coming out of, uh, but those things will keep our immune system strong. And most importantly, because of COVID is that we're practicing our physical distancing and hygiene and who we socialize with. Next. So common healthcare acquired infections that we traditionally see out in our community are urinary tract infections, respiratory system, colds, pneumonia, bronchitis, flu. And interestingly, and I only know about Canada, we have the lowest incidence of flu this year. And that's because we've been physical distancing, not as great as we should be, but it's because we've been physical distancing. Um, gastrointestinal issues, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and any type of skin uh, infection. So anywhere from a bed sore, a wound, any IV infiltration sites, um, anybody who's got ports or central access lines for uh, dialysis or chemotherapy, et cetera, those are high risk um, areas for infection. So. We want to, again, be really cautious um, that when we're dealing with anybody who's got a healthcare acquired infection, especially that we're not bringing COVID-19 to those individuals. So back in the day of SARS, um, yes, sorry, I will speak slower, thank you. Um, there was a renewed emphasis on infection control and that was post SARS. So to give you a simple example, um, pre-SARS, if somebody needed to go in the hospital who had respiratory issues and they needed to have a mask put on in the emergency room and it would be attached to a little machine called a nebulizer. That nebulizer mask would allow medication to moisturely get into their system quickly and relieve their symptoms. And as an ER nurse way back when, we could do that. And there'd just be a curtain separating us. Post SARS, we weren't allowed to do that anymore. And those are called aerosol generating medical procedures, AGMPs. So aerosol generating medical procedures are a big risk for COVID-19 because of the transmission of the virus. So really important when we're dealing with individuals who have AGMPs, like suctioning a trach, for example, BiPAP, CPAP, those types of things, really, really important that we um, are using the proper PPE, and I'll get to that in subsequent slides. But SARS was just one issue, AIDS, avian flu, H1N1, hepatitis C, and all of the antibiotic resistant organisms that we now have in our community. And there's a website there in red if you wanna get more information about that. Um, there are lots of things to worry about. And interestingly, recently working at our local hospital, everybody was so afraid of antibiotic resistant organisms and now everybody has sort of put that behind them. And now they're all just afraid of COVID-19 and the things that used to make us nervous don't make us nervous anymore. Next slide. So we're going to talk about the chain of infection. There are six steps to the chain of infection, and there's lots of information in the PowerPoint. The best way to stop the chain is by breaking it. So let's just start with COVID-19 as our infectious agent. So I'm on the top of the screen in the first dot, and that's infectious agent COVID-19. Where does it live? On the second dot, which is the reservoir, it lives inside of my chest my respiratory system. How does it get out of my respiratory system? By sneezing, by coughing, by mucous membranes is the portal of exit. And if I bypass modes of transmission, the portal of entry is the same way it comes out of my body is the same way it gets inside of your body. So again, when we get to proper PPE, hand washing, that's critical to prevent the portal of entry from happening to you. How does it go from a portal of exit to a portal of entry is by mode of transmission. So staying six feet away from somebody will take those droplets and prevent them from getting close enough to be inserted into your body. But modes of transmission also mean surfaces. So if I'm touching your door handle, I'm touching your sink, I'm touching your phone, 
I'm touching your remote for your mechanical lift, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people aren't washing their hands in between all these activities, wearing their gloves appropriately, then that mode of transmission can be the droplets on any of those inanimate surfaces. So really important, we think about the distance of ourselves and all the things that we're all touching in your living environment. And then we talk about a susceptible host. And what we used to say a susceptible host was, was an individual who was less than 12 years of age, had not quite yet reached puberty, because our immune system fully develops at puberty. Anybody over the age of 65, or anybody who had a chronic disease process, diabetes, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, all those types of diseases, make somebody more susceptible. I personally feel that uh, as our future moves forward in this pandemic, we're going to see that the definition of a susceptible host is going to change dramatically. I think the youngest person on record was nine years old who died uh, from COVID in the States who had no comorbidities. He had none of those health issues whatsoever, and yet he died of, of COVID. We had recently a gentleman in Waterloo who was 30, I think it was in Waterloo, I may be wrong, um, again with no comorbidities, and he died of COVID-19. So how is it that some people with no chronic disease process are impacted dramatically? Um, by these things. So what can you do? Make sure you've got a good, strong immune system and make sure you break that chain of infection. And the best way is by good hand hygiene, making we wash our hands really well, don't touch your face, and we wear proper PPE. So John, you can go right through the rest of those slides now. So routine practices is what IPAC talks about all the time. And routine practices basically mean any bodily fluid from somebody that secretes should be treated as potentially infectious. So mucous membranes, non-intact skin, so any broken skin. What we wanna do is make sure that we use hand hygiene Alcohol-based hand rubs, according to the World Health Organization or the WHO, are more accessible. It doesn't mean they're better, it just makes they're more accessible. So it's good to have them. It depends on the document that you read. Public um, Health and Safety indicates a 60% alcohol content. Um, the WHO and Public Health Ontario uh, suggest 70% alcohol content. So you're going to see variations of that. Uh, the process is the most important thing and when we wash our hands, which should be very frequently. Use of personal protective equipment, like masks and gloves and gowns and face shields um, will help us to prevent um, getting infected and breaking that sort of transmission. Soap and water when available is always the best, um, but it's not usually readily as available as alcohol-based hand rubs. Okay, thanks, John. So if you have an illness, you must be responsible. So remember, minimal risk, predictable outcome. We're trying to prevent. So cover your mouth and your nose, using our elbow, using a tissue, making sure that tissue goes in the garbage, you don't drop it on the countertop where all those little droplets, because remember the inanimate objects, now you put mucus in a Kleenex, you put the Kleenex on the couch or the floor or the table. Now all those little droplets have spread and that's not what you want to happen. Uh, the World Health Organization used to say to stay one feet away from, or sorry, one meter away from individuals. And now obviously with COVID it's two meters or six feet away. We want to visit our doctor virtually if our symptoms do not disappear or become worse. Frequent hand washing. If you've got any cuts on your hands, please make sure that you um, cover your hands with gloves and stay home from work if you're sick. Um, immunization and annual flu shots, really important. I was doing a lot of research for the upcoming vaccination workshop that um, I'm privileged to be a part of with SILT and um, they were, alluding to the fact, and remember, everything is always changing. So every day I read something and I learn something new and something changes. 
Um, they're sort of talking about a booster COVID shot that will go with an annual flu shot is something that they're talking about now. So risk assessment is really, really important and it takes into account things like, what is my risk of exposure to bodily fluids? Remember that's not just direct exposure, it's on inanimate objects like your telephone. The type of bodily fluids that the attendant may come into contact with, the route of exposure to those germs, the level of risk to the consumer and the attendant. So we're looking at keeping each other healthy. The time it takes to complete an activity that involves potential exposure. And so I know in my nursing uh, job, we're trying, when we're caring for people with COVID, we're trying to minimize 15 minutes or less, even with proper PPE, 15 minutes or less uh, direct exposure to those individuals and the environment in which the activity is being carried out. When at all possible, the door should always be closed if you're caring for a COVID individual. Air circulation is really great if you can have air circulation. Our weather is getting nicer now, so that's more potential for that to happen. So what causes the flu and how is it spread? So type A and type B are the common types of uh, viruses of our flu. They live in our mucous membranes that we talked about earlier, nose, mouth, eyes, and on your skin spreads very, very easily. When you sneeze, when you cough, when you talk, there's tiny little droplets that get in the air. Those contain the flu. So if you try to cover your mouth, stay six feet away from individuals, hopefully you're not going to get sick. Some people get sick, some people don't. The stronger your immune system is, you're hoping to prevent yourself. And again, by getting your flu vaccine, it helps to reduce the incidence or severity, just like the COVID vaccine does, the severity of uh, illness that is, is presented. And don't forget all those things like doorknobs and phones and things like that that um, have droplets on them as well. So what is COVID-19? It's a virus that's transmitted via droplets from close unprotected contact. Um, airborne spread in our country in Canada has not been documented. Um, as a way to um, for someone to become sick from COVID-19 or to, for it to be transmitted, but it is for aerosol generating medical procedures. Remember those AGMPs I talked about with uh, a trach suctioning somebody, um, BiPAP, CPAP, those types of things. So together, if we work together and do physical distancing, I'm sure you guys are sick and tired of that term like everybody else is. Um, but if we do that and we do proper PPE and we avoid social gatherings and it's so hard when this beautiful weather is out and people wanna get together um, and they want a handshake and they want a hug. And um, those are just the risks that, that propagate this, this horrible virus from getting worse. Prepper hand hygiene. So um, when you use soap and water, and we're gonna watch some great videos and I am gonna give some more detail about that. Um, soap and water for at least 20 seconds. So it's like singing the happy birthday song twice. And there's a way that we wash our hands that is most beneficial, which I'll talk about and you'll see in the video. And again, when we don't have soap and water, alcohol-based hand rubs are the next um, most reliable. As long as your hands aren't visibly soiled, you can use um, hand sanitizers, or if you're not caring for somebody um, who has a spore type of infection, so C. diff um, is a spore type of infection, C. difficile or C. diff is called, and you have to use soap and water because alcohol-based hand rubs won't work with C. diff. So cleaning, um, when we talk about cleaning surfaces to try to minimize the risk. Um, Health Canada has published a list of, of disinfectants that are most likely effective. Um, they don't claim to kill the COVID-19, but cleaners can um, play a role in minimizing the transfer um, of microorganisms or germs. So you can use regular household bleach that is diluted according to the directions. Um, it's really difficult to find the actual concentration of bleach, um, uh, sodium hypochlorite is what is the name that is given to it. Um, but if you check any bleach bottle, they say it's a trade secret. 
So it's hard to do the, the, the mixture, but I know what we do in a situation like that in either clinical setting that I have worked in a hospital um, or a community hospice is we take one cup of water, just normal tap water, and we put one teaspoon of bleach in that. But remember, whenever you're using bleach, people with respiratory issues or reactions, you've got to be cautious that you're not going into someone's home and using that because it could cause some serious reactions for that individual. And the surfaces we think about are toilets, phones, electronics, door handles, nightside tables, television remotes, mechanical lift remotes, commode chairs, those types of things that we wanna clean those um, with this type of solution to reduce that sort of viral load. So what else can you do? Wear masks or face coverings. So um, public health some time ago when I first put this workshop together for SILT um, recommended wearing um, medical grade masks. So surgical or procedural masks or medical grade masks um, when you're caring for an individual. Because you remember this is about keeping you, the consumer, the client safe, as well as your family members and the attendants that are providing care for you. And anybody who has COVID or, um, or aerosol generation and N95 uh, mask should be used for those COVID-19 patients. They recommend non-medical grade um, three-ply masks when we're just out in general public, when you can't keep that sort of two meter physical distance uh, from individuals. So that's grocery stores, shopping, public transit, um, those things. And again, remember we have federal legislation and provincial legislation. So federal is that big umbrella and all the provinces fall underneath that. And every province is responsible for their response through their public health units, of which we have 34. And every area may be different. So you may be talking to a friend in Ottawa, for example, and things are different there than they are here. Hand washing, alcohol-based hand rubs, it's the most important thing for, for, for stopping the spread of, of germs. Um, and it needs to be done frequently. Fingernails have a high potential risk, so no fake nails. Um, I'm holding my hand up and I'm looking at the palm of my hand. And when I look at the palm of my hand, I should not see any of my own fingernails when I look at the palm of my hand. If I see my fingernails, that's a potential risk for microorganisms to grow in. So good to keep your nails short, no fake nails, no chip nail polish, um, lots of other bacteria like to grow in those spaces. And always wash your thumbs really well because when we do audits, that's one of the places that people often forget is their thumbs. The components of good hand hygiene include turning on the tap to a nice comfortable temperature, not hot, not cold. You wanna wet your hands, you use one pump of soap, you rub your hands together. So what you do is you rub your palms together, then you interlace your fingers. So you get on both sides of your pinky finger or your baby finger. So you interlace them one way and then you interlace them the other way. Then you do your thumb and they do your thumb. And then we do our nail beds and our nail beds and our wrists. And my hands are up near my face, which is never where you would wash your hands, but I'm just showing that for demonstration purposes. And for 20 seconds or longer, if you're using soap or water, you rinse under the warm water. So your fingers should always be in a downward fashion. You don't wanna spray anything towards your face, always in that sort of downward fashion. Paper towel and you pat dry. If you scrub your hands dry, what you do is you break little holes in your skin, which is a right portal of entry for infection. So remember I talked about how we get infections in that six little diagrams of the little circles. So broken skin, when you rub like this to dry your hands, as opposed to patting them, then you reduce the risk of breaking your own skin. If a client doesn't have paper towel or soap um, and water access in their home, and we all have different financial burdens, especially during COVID. What I like to do when I'm going out to work in the community to do nursing visits is I take some old dishcloths that my wife has that are stained and they're washed and clean. I just tuck one in my pocket. And then when I wash my hands, it's really, it's the friction that really, really helps. 
and I just keep that dishcloth and I use it the whole time I'm in your home to wash and pat dry my hands and then I put it in a bag and I wash it with my dirty uniforms. If there is paper towel available, it's good to take a piece of paper towel and turn off the tap so that you don't end up um, transmitting any germs back to that tap. And again, please remember if you're caring for a client with C. diff, you can't use the same tap that they use. And good moisturizer, so the World Health Organization talks about good moisturizer. And they say every 10th time you wash your hands, the 11th time you should use good moisturizer. Again, alcohol-based hand rub when you don't have access to soap and water depends on which document you read or where you get your research, 60 to 90% of isopropanol or ethanol alcohol. And if you can get some with aloe in it, makes it nicer for your skin so they don't dry out. In the first wave, I'm sure we were washing our hands with pure vodka. I, I work close to the distillery district in Toronto. And some days I swear it was pure vodka I was washing my hands with. So when we're using alcohol-based hand rubs, you want to apply a small amount. So 1.5 to 3 mils. So a teaspoon, to give you a visual, a teaspoon is 5 mils. So you want 1.5 to 3 mils. You want it in the palm of your hand. And what you rub your palms together. And just like we did, we lace our fingers together. So we get one side of my pinky. Then I interlace my fingers and get the other side of my pinky. Then I do my finger pads on the palm of one hand and then my finger pads on the palm of the other hand. Then I get my thumb really well, give my thumb a really good rub and you have to wash your hands until they are completely dry. If you don't and you're putting on gloves, your gloves will stick and they won't go on properly. That's a risk for infection. Remember that alcohol-based hand rubs are flammable, so you wanna be cautious with it. And remember, in bold red, if your hands are visibly soiled, you must wash them with soap and water. So any bodily fluid. When should you wash your hands? At the beginning of every visit, before direct contact, especially when you're dealing with immunocompromised individuals. Those may be on chemotherapy, radiation, chronic disease like diabetes. And for sure when you leave, because you're gonna be in contact with another individual. When your hands have touched any inanimate objects, garbage, laundry, bedpans, anything like that. And of course, after going to the bathroom. After blowing your nose or coughing into your hands, sneezing, before touching your face. One of the things I see that drives me crazy um, is people who are constantly pulling at their face mask. Um, really, really not good eye pack. Um, when people need to remove their mask, they should be removing their mask from one side of their face. So unloop an ear. If you're going to take a bite of your sandwich, a drink of your juice, of course, you've washed your hands before, then you put it back on. You don't grab the front of your mask and pull your mask down onto your dirty chin and then take a bite of your sandwich and then grab your mask which is now dirty from your chin, and now you're gonna take all those germs and put them in your nose and your mouth. It's not what we wanna do. Don't share lotion with other people. Make sure you wash your hands after you take off your gloves and for sure when you leave that client's home. 
So we're going to watch some videos uh, now. We're going to watch about proper gloving, proper gowning, face protection, hand hygiene. Um, and then I'm going to go through some more slides. So John's going to put up the videos and they're going to be um, closed captioned. So you'll be able to read as well. Check that your hands are visibly clean. If there is obvious soiling, follow the steps for hand washing. Apply one to two pumps of product to the palms of your dry hand. Rub your hands together, palm to palm. Rub in between and around your fingers. Rub the back of each hand with the palm of your other hand. Rub the fingertips of each hand in your opposite palm. Rub each thumb clasped in the opposite hand. Rub your hands until the product is dry. This will take a minimum of 15 seconds if sufficient product has been used. Wet your hands with warm water. Do not use water that is too hot or too cool as it is hard on your skin and will lead to dryness. Apply liquid or foam soap. Lather the soap and rub your hands palm to palm. In healthcare settings, bar soap should not be used for hand washing because it is easily contaminated. Rub in between and around your fingers. Rub the back of each hand with the palm of your other hand. Rub the fingertips of each hand in your opposite palm. Rub each thumb clasped in your opposite hand. After a minimum of 15 seconds, rinse your hands thoroughly under running water. Be sure that all soap is removed as soap will dry your skin. Pat your hands dry with paper towel. Rubbing with paper towels can damage your skin. Turn off the water using a paper towel to avoid recontaminating your hands. Dispose of the paper towel into a waste container. Perform hand hygiene for 15 seconds. Put on gown. Put on mask. Put on gloves.
remove gloves. Remove gown. Perform hand hygiene for 15 seconds. It is important to clean your hands after removing gown and gloves to make sure that infectious agents are removed before you touch your face. Remove mask. Perform hand hygiene for 15 seconds. It is important to clean your hands after removing facial protection because they are considered to be contaminated. Thanks, John. So the references are there for people to watch um, those videos as often as you like. So when we, yep, thank you. So the appropriate equipment should be used anytime you're gonna come into contact with bodily fluids or any non-intact skin. So any cut or broken skin. If you do have issues and some people do have issues, um, they actually make alcohol-less um, hand sanitizer. So it has other components if you're allergic to alcohol, for example, and there's special creams that people can get um, because in the advent of COVID, I've seen some pretty nasty looking hands on my coworkers who suffer from those types of allergies. So don't be afraid to contact your healthcare provider who will help you out with um, proper stuff that won't hurt you. Public Health Agency of Canada has always said, as has the WHO, Adherence to hand hygiene is the single most important practice for preventing the transmission of germs. Bar none, hand washing is the best. So it's written out again um, there. I won't go through it because we've already talked about it, but it's on slide 45. And just a reminder that the use of gloves is not a substitute for hand washing. So if you see your attendants not washing their hands before putting on or taking off their gloves, it is not a substitute. They still need to wash their hands. Remember everything in life is 95%. So those gloves can have little microscopic holes in them. So on slide 46, there's an actual visual um, from Public Health Ontario on how to hand wash that we've um, already discussed. So there's a visual uh, tool there. When you've got cuts in your hands, that's a right portal of entry. So remember this, the chain of infection, the six little dots we talked about. If you've got cuts in your hand, make sure that you cover those cuts. So I'm always very conscientious of trying to not use um, too many supplies when I'm in somebody's home because it costs them money. Um, but I'll always um, preface the, the need to wear gloves in that I've got a cut on my hand, the Band-Aid I had that was waterproof fell off at the last consumer and I don't have another one with me. So I like to sort of set the framework of why I'm wearing gloves in an incident when I wouldn't normally wear gloves because I've got a cut on my hand. Remember the artificial nails we talked about? Making sure when you look at the palm of your hand that you should not see your fingernails on the opposite side of that when you're looking at the palm of your hand. Um, keep your hands away from any mucus um, membrane, eyes, nose, or mouth. And again, we got to stop that grabbing our mask uh, on the front because that's just a right portal of entry for infection. And always assume that any human bodily fluid is potentially infectious. So alcohol-based hand rubs, again, according to Public Health Ontario. So now Public Health Ontario says 70 to 90% alcohol. Again, just really reinforcing, you 
can only use ABHRs or alcohol-based hand rubs uh, for things when your hands are not visibly soiled with any bodily fluid from an individual, okay? Or any other thing that may, if your hands are dirty, you gotta use soap and water, then you can use ABHRs. And remember the WHO says on the 11th time, use good hand cream and put it on the same way. Next. So there's an image on slide number 49 that shows how to use alcohol-based hand rub. And again, you, you don't need a ton, so you don't need to saturate it and put four tablespoons on because remember it's alcohol and it dries out your skin. The four moments of hand hygiene has been around for as long as I've been in healthcare. Before initial consumer environment contact, before any procedure where there's risk of bodily fluids or putting on your gloves, after bodily fluid exposure and removing your gloves and after consumer environmental contact. Gloves protect our hands. Gowns or aprons protect our skin or clothing. Masks and rep respirators protect the mouth and the nose. Goggles protect our eyes and face shields protect the entire face. So you can get a mask face shield combination like you saw in that video. Um, those aren't the best. It's um, a separate face shield and a separate mask are better. You wanna don your PPE before contact with the consumer. Be careful not to spread contamination. You want to remove and discard appropriately. So just as you saw in the video, the garbage can was right there. So the person could dispose of things properly in the garbage can. And about the hand hygiene, really, really important. What the Hospital Association has said recently, so you saw in the video that when the person took off their PPE, the first thing they took off was their gloves. Um, if you watch the video, the caregiver took both gloved hands, one gloved hand to the palm of the opposite gloved hand, and she pulled off that glove, but she left the glove dangling. The World Health Organization says to take that dirty glove that you just put into your other gloved hand and roll it up in a tight little ball. Then what it's called the glove to glove skin to skin technique. Then what you do is the finger that you took your sorry, the hand that you took your glove off of, you take those two fingers and you slide your wrist your fingers tight against your wrist underneath the, the other dirty glove and you roll it over top. And by doing that, what you do is that dirty glove is now contained in the other dirty glove. I hope that made sense. Um, and what you're trying to do is encapsulate the dirty gloves and what you have on the outside is the clean surface. So when you drop them in the garbage, if somebody happens to knock the garbage can over, what you've got exposed is the clean inside of the glove versus pulling off your gloves and dropping them with the outside exposed, which has all the germs on it. So when you're going to put on PPE, you put on your gown, then you put on your mask, then you put on your goggles, then you put on your gloves. You're going to wash your hands before you start that entire process. And you don't need to wash your hands again until you're doing the doffing component, unless something has happened during that process that your hands have become dirty. When you put on your gown, you want the appropriate type and size. So if the gown is too small and won't go all the way around to the back and cover all your clothing at the back, what you should do is use two gowns. The first one, you're going to put on like a house coat. So you put it on from the back and you wrap it around and tie it. Then you'll have a space at the front that's not covered. So then you put another gown on forward facing, tie it at the back, and therefore you're all nice and covered. You wanna cover all of your clothes because those gowns are made from medical grade 
um, material that is fluid resistant and they're specifically designed to protect you. So if you leave your clothing exposed, then you go to somebody else's home, potentially you've got some bacteria or viruses or fungi or pear that's gonna come with you. Okay, next slide. So when we talk about reusable gowns, and I don't know if anybody has any uh, multi-use or reusable gowns, if you do, um, they're usually made of 100% cotton or polyester or a cotton polyester blend, and they are chemically finished. Um, and by being chemically finished, what it means is they can be washed on a high temperature and dried on a high temperature and reused. So if you do have those, I'm not talking about a handmade one that you made yourself. I'm talking about a medical grade one. They need to be washed separately and dried separately to reduce the transmission. So you wanna wash them on hot water and dry them on the hottest temperature. And only one caregiver should use that multi-use reusable gown while they're working with you. And then it should go into your a separate soiled linen box or bag or something so it can be washed appropriately. Disposable masks and eye protection should be worn to protect your eyes, your nose, and your mouth during activities. Um, disposable masks should obviously never be shared. They should be disposed of at the end of each use. Disposable masks um, are only good as long as they don't become moist. So when you find moisture inside of your mask, and especially if you can see the moisture from the outside, that mask is no longer doing its job. So masks have two components to them. One is fluid resistance, and the other is filtration efficiency. And there are levels. So a level one, level two, and level three. So a level one mask is what they're suggesting. And the reason they're suggesting it is because they provide a 95% filtration for particles. And this is a little bit technical, but it'll make sense of 0 0.1 microns, okay? So they will protect you against that type of a, a micron from, from, or a germ from an individual. They also have a fluid resistancy to them. So a level one mask, you know, when you get your blood taken, let's say that the lab tech or the nurse who took your blood, um, the needle fell out and the blood started to splatter and it went on, on the mask. There's not, but remember, it's only 95%. It would protect me from that blood from your vein splashing onto my mask. It wouldn't go through, it wouldn't go through the mask. Okay. So it helps us because the, the size of the micron for COVID-19 um, is much larger than the smallest size that it protects us again. So as long as we're wearing them appropriately and not um, and putting them on and taking them off properly and proper hand hygiene, they will protect us. Goggles and face shields protect our eyes. And again, public health is saying, you know, as John said earlier, we are in our third wave and a separate mask and a separate face shield are better. Um, it makes the mask last longer and it gives you that extra protection. Whereas when you've got the mask, as you saw in the video with the face shield, you don't get quite the same amount of protection. So on slide 57, it talks about standard um, masks, fluid resistant masks, and then surgical masks and N95 masks. So what we were talking about is a surgical procedure uh, mask of a level one. Um, they can be expensive, so I know it's hard, but I know SILT um, has some, uh, Lisa was saying the last two sessions, they've got some direct funding around helping with supplies. Um, and an N95 mask, again, is, a, is someone has to be fitted for that um, mask, and that's for that aerosol generation medical procedure. So trach suctioning, CPAP, BiPAP, uh, assist machine, those types of things you need an N95 mask for. And um, caution around N95 masks is you have to be refit every two years. 
and if you gain or lose more than 15 pounds. And slide 58 is just again talking about the visual that was on slide 57 that I've already discussed. And again, public health recommends a procedural mask be worn for direct client care, which is a level one. Next slide. So when you're going to put on your mask, it goes over your nose and your mouth. And remember, there's usually a bar at the top that you want to pinch against your nose so that you get it as secure as you possibly can. You want to secure it if it's the ties, then you're going to secure it at your neck and the top of your head. And if it's the elastic ear laps, then they go around your ears. Um, those can be hard for people's ears. They can hurt. They're one size. So what some people um, have done is they take a little piece of material, they sew some buttons on it, and then you put that material with the buttons on it on the nape of your neck. Then what you do is you take those little elastics that would normally go around your ears and you hook them on the buttons to get that nice secure um, fit. So it's a nice cheap and cheerful way if you've got somebody who sews. Um, I've seen them at Walmart. I think they're three for um, $5, I think maybe, or dollar store. I've seen them at the dollar store for two, I think $2. It just, it'll really help your ears if you find you're wearing them a, a lot. So when they're soiled, damp, or damaged, you want to make sure you take them off because they're not protecting you anymore. So some examples when we may use gloves for incontinent care, bowel or bladder, mouth care, catheter care, suctioning. We always want to work from clean to dirty. So high touch risk areas. So remember, don't touch your face or adjust your PPE with your dirty gloves on. If you just absolutely have to scratch your nose, then you're going to have to take everything off, wash your hands, do it properly, and then you're going to have to put it all back on again. Change your gloves if they're dirty, soiled, even with the same client, and make sure everything goes in the garbage can. Never wash or reuse disposable gloves and do not use alcohol-based hand rub to wash your gloves to use them again because the alcohol will break down the glove and won't protect you. When you put on your gloves, when you put on your gloves, you're gonna wash your hands. The gloves are the last thing that go on. So it's your gown. It's your mask, it's your eyewear, and gloves are the last thing. Make sure you have the correct size of glove. Don't wear them too big because they're not going to protect you. Sometimes people, especially new caregivers, tend to wear bigger gloves because they're nervous. Their hands get wet. And when your hands get wet, it's hard to get the, the glove to go on properly. And make sure when you're wearing a gown that the gown sleeve is tucked inside the glove so that you put your glove over top so it creates a nice seal. What's contaminated and what's clean? So the outside front is always something that is contaminated, anything that comes in contact with bodily fluids. Clean is considered on the inside or the ties at the back. To take off your PPE, so this has changed with um, the, the second to third wave now, the um, according to the Ontario Hospital Association. So you're going to take off your gloves, you're going to wash your hands. So this slide 65 doesn't have that on it because this is from public health. So you remove your gloves, wash your hands. Remove your gown, wash your hands. Remove your eye protection, wash your hands. Remove your mask, wash your hands. So now what they're saying on the Ontario Hospital Association is wash your hands when you're doffing or taking off in between every single component. So 
when you're taking off your gloves, again, as I described, you, you've got two gloved hands. So what you're going to do is take one gloved hand to the palm of the opposite gloved hand, and you're going to pull that glove straight off. And you want to be close to the garbage can. You want to roll up that dirty glove inside of the gloved hand. So now you shouldn't be able to see the dirty glove you just took off. It should be encapsulated in your dirty glove. That's called glove to glove. And now you're gonna take your two fingers from your ungloved hand. You're gonna slide them between your wrist and your dirty glove. And you're going to roll that dirty glove over top of the other glove that was in the palm of your hand. Perfect. And then what you've got is a little bag of dirty gloves. But remember the outside is dirty and the inside is clean. So by putting them inside of the outside of the gloves, you're exposing the inside. And if that garbage can gets flipped over, you won't have as many germs because you've got the inside of the glove exposed. And you'll see lots of people don't do that properly, <laughs> sadly. So when you're gonna take off your isolation gown, you unfasten the ties at the neck, obviously, again, remember hand hygiene. You wanna peel the gown away from you. So if you grab the straps and you pull it forward, you're exposing the inside. Remember you washed your hands, so your hands are clean. So then you roll it from the inside, just like you did with your dirty gloves. What you wanna do is put the inside on the outside. So you wanna roll it up in a ball so the inside is on the outside and the outside is on the inside, containing all those germs. And again, be in front of the garbage can to drop it. And again, hand hygiene. Always, always, always hand hygiene. Environmental controls. So as support people, we need to clean the areas um, in, the, in the consumer's home and the equipment. So again, good hand hygiene. Make sure that you read the label of that cleaning equipment so you know how to use it. Never mix cleaning equipment. If you mix them, you're gonna be in trouble. Could get lots of harmful fumes, could make you lightheaded and faint. We always clean from highest to lowest, from dry to wet and from the cleanest area to the dirtiest area. Change your cleaning cloths frequently. When you're going to dust, because remember there's germs, microbes in dust, you wanna use a slightly damp cloth to pick up the dust. You don't wanna circulate the dust, especially if people have respiratory issues, that, that dust can be problematic. And if you've used any harsh chemical, you may wanna rinse and dry that surface as well. You want to, according to public health, clean and disinfect frequently touched areas in your home, bathroom, toilet surfaces at least once per day, especially when contaminated with spiritory secretions. And a disinfectant wipe is a great thing to use on top of that. And please be aware of consumers who have sensitivity to scents. There are lots of products that will do the exact same level of cleaning that are um, designed for people with scent issues. Sadly, they usually cost more money. So we are doing a vaccination uh, webinar in April. Um, so vaccinations really are proven to prevent serious communicable illnesses. So what they do is they, they try to minimize hospitalization and serious illness. So we're really, really encouraging healthcare workers to get their vaccines, make sure they're up to date, and of course, to get their COVID-19 vaccines. So I'm looking forward to our session in, in April, and hopefully I can answer um, most, if not all, of your questions about vaccine. But there are great websites. Um, John has added the COVID vaccine information for Toronto um, and about uh, how to get vaccinated. So there's lots of websites that you can go to, but remember, each public health, um, independent public health um, of the 34 that we have in Ontario, 
their rollout is designed on how they choose to design it, right? So it can be completely different from one place to another and how they prioritize it can be completely different um, based on a lot of factors that we're gonna talk about in April. So key takeaway, good hand hygiene to get rid of germs, stay home if you're sick, practice routine practices, Anytime you're gonna come into contact with bodily fluids, good hand hygiene, PPE, keep your immune system strong, eat well, exercise, get enough sleep, get your immunization, try to control your stress. And as we started at the beginning, we wanna operate from a minimal risk with a predictable outcome. How do we do that? It's about prevention. We want to stop the spread. We don't want to increase it. Remember, people can be asymptomatic or have no symptoms. There's that incubation period. So just because everybody looks healthy doesn't mean that we are healthy. There are lots of people who go out into the community who don't use proper PPE or physical distancing. They are asymptomatic, and that's how our community spread has gotten so out of control. Remember that chain of infection. So if you just keep the chain of infection broken in any one of those places and hand washing is the World Health Organization and Public Health says is the best way to do it, you hopefully won't get sick or make somebody else sick. All righty, that's the end. And we'll do the Q&A part and I'll pass it over to Rebecca to ask the questions that people submitted when they registered. And you can also put your question in the chat and Rebecca will anonymously ask it. Great, thank you so much, Tim, for all of that wonderful information. Yeah. Um, we have a few questions that have come through the chat and a few from uh, that came through the registration. So I'll bounce back and forth. Um, and the first question is, is there any benefit to double masking? Great question. I don't have a scientific answer for you, um, but I have a correlation answer for you. So double gloving is always one of those um, big areas of concern in healthcare. A huge research study was done years ago in the UK. And surgeons who need fine motor skills, some double gloved for protection and others didn't. Out of that 50-50, people said double, either 50% were for it and 50% were against it. And the cited reason for the against it was there was a false sense of security with two pairs of gloves on, which then made people a little bit weak in their critical thinking process. So they operated a little bit more risky. So if I compare that to double masking, to me, it would be the same thing. I think there would be that false sense of security. Two is better than one. I also think for respiratory issues, it may make it harder for people to breathe. During the first wave, when everything was, uh, supplies were at a minimum, um, we had to keep our level one mask. And then when we needed an N95, we put it over top. And I can tell you that I personally became very short of breath. And I, I felt um, that my N95, because it was designed to go against my skin, not against another mask. And I really felt that uh, it wasn't as secure of a fit. So I don't have a scientific answer for you, but I hope that helps. Um, again, it, I guess it could be personal choice, um, but I'm sorry, I don't have a scientific answer for you. Thank you, Tim. Um, another mask related question, actually there are a few mask related questions, um, is if I wear a mask, 
am I protected from others or, or am I protecting others from myself? Another great question. So again, depending on the research that you look at, um, masking is designed a level one mask at 95% efficacy, right? So 95% of that level one mask is designed for fluid resistance and filtration. And the filtration rate is much higher than the COVID size of germ, if we wanna say. If you read other scientific studies, they say masks don't protect you. As a healthcare worker of 42 years, I've worn masks my whole entire career when there was risk like we have now. And touch wood, I haven't gotten sick yet. So to me, it protects you and it also protects the individual that is with you. And if you're both wearing a mask, to me, then you've got double the protection. But if you ask some scientists, they'll say that's hogwash. <laughs> My son being one of those people. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Um, someone writes, I often find that my masks are coming down when I speak. Is there a way to avoid this? Yeah, so the, um, you know that little thing um, I talked about that you could put at the nape of your neck? Um, you make it with the buttons or you buy it at Walmart. It's a little strap. If you put it on the top of your head, higher up at the sort of back here of your head, it will pull the mask upward and hold it more centered on your face. So it's all about how we put those strings because you're absolutely right. As our jaw goes down and they're stopping here at our ears, it tends to fall down. If you have a smaller nose, um, I've got a big nose, so it's not a problem for me, but if you've got a smaller nose, it can slide down. Um, so where you put that um, little strap can be helpful. Great. Um, how about the reusable cotton or fabric uh, fabric cloth face masks, um, are those safe to be wearing? So, um, public health has said a level one mask for all care because we don't know about the community spread. Remember we talked earlier about the fact that you're asymptomatic prior to symptoms and you may show no symptoms. And after the fact, you're asymptomatic after you're better if you did show symptoms. Uh, even with immunization, we're going to learn about in April um, that until we get that herd immunity level, even though you've had your, your shot like I have had, you still need to use all of the precautions, physical distancing, hand washing, masking, all of those um, types of things. That, that connects to somebody asked how long you think we might be wearing masks for. Oh, Lord have mercy. That, that's the golden question. You'd be filthy rich if you knew that answer. <laughs> um, sadly, I mean, in the research I've been doing, and remember, we've only been vaccinating since January. So um, in the research that I've been doing um, to prepare for April, uh, we've really, four to six months is sort of the um, time frame that the vaccines are sort of covering people against serious uh, illness. So it's, and again, it's so new, there's just, there's just not enough data um, for hard and black and white answers. So um, I think it's gonna be a long time, but that's just me personally as a healthcare worker and as a nurse is, I think it's gonna be a long time, sadly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, somebody asked about the P100 type face masks um about their efficacy and i'm not sure whether that's a level one type mask or if you know yeah i i don't know um so what i again what i would say is public health is saying if you're providing direct care you need a level one mask so as long as it meets the the criteria that it's a medical grade level one mask then i would say yes but i don't know the answer um to that question Thank you. Um, 
I know that you you touched on this, but could you could you re-explain the difference between an N95 and a KN95? And if there's a type that people should be using uh, for personal use, like going to medical appointments or going out in the world? So a, a KN95 is like a knockoff. Um, so, you know, when you want a Fendi purse and you buy a knockoff at the corner, <laughs> like that. So I wouldn't want to be having a knockoff mask. I think it would be higher risk. An N95 mask is, is um, designed to fit a person specifically. Uh, 3M makes a, an 8210, and that's my fit, for example. Um, if you've got a smaller nose, you have a different fit. If you have a more flatter face and a rounder face, it, it all depends. So they are specific masks that are approved to ensure that the, the seal and the fit is going to ensure that nothing will get inside of, of that mask from an aerosol generation medical procedure. So I would not be, especially if I'm immunocompromised, be um, looking at a knockoff type of mask. I would be asking why the person is using a KN95 um, as opposed to a regular procedural mask if they're just going out. It, if there's no aerosol generating medical procedure um, in public health, if you go on public health and type in AGMPs, it will give you a list. And remember, different places have different AGMPs. Um, I don't know why they would want to be wearing it. Maybe it's a sense of security. Um, what public health says is a regular procedure mask. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be doing care, and then what they say, um, if you're out in the public, is that sort of three-layered uh, mask. If you can't keep that sort of six feet from people. Okay, that is very very helpful to know. Um, any recommendations on how to deal with glasses fogging up when wearing a mask? And they say healthcare professionals must have mastered this long before the pandemic took hold. Yes. Yeah, so no, we have not. <laughs> as, as a glasses wearer, I've uh, resorted to my contacts. So I've gone back to wearing contacts um, because I just could not master it. Now, what some people have said is that when you, um, when you put the mask tight up here uh, on the bridge of my nose, I'm pointing, sorry, for visually impaired people on the bridge of my nose, you know, where you push down that metal, the problem therein lies, and then you put your glasses just a little bit lower than what you do is you reduce the air from getting inside, um, but then it, it kind of pokes you in the corners of your eyes, that metal piece, and it hurts. So I have not found a, a great way to, um, to reduce that, nor have my colleagues. Um, so contacts is my, my way of getting around that. I have definitely been wearing my sunglasses below my nose when I'm wearing a mask, but it's a funny feeling. Yeah, it's an odd feeling. And if they're prescription, it, it can distort your vision if, because you're measured with them to fit appropriately, right? That's right. Um, someone asks, should PSWs be wearing a face shield or goggles alongside masks? So what a face shield uh, does is it helps to increase the longevity of, the, of your mask. So if I'm gonna be in your home for four hours, for example, and I'm hot, it's hot in your home, there's risk of the, the mask getting contaminated, a face shield really helps to increase the longevity and it also helps to protect from droplets. Now that's provided they clean it appropriately afterward, like with an alcohol wipe or a disinfecting, um, a disinfecting wipe and some places are making it mandatory. So I know some supportive housing uh, providers um, it, for the disabled community have made it mandatory based on all the research they have done and recommendations is that you need to wear goggles and a face mask. So some are mandatory and some are um, situational. So for me personally, I think it's a good idea again because of that asymptomatic transmission we just don't know. And I know it must just feel awful for somebody who is receiving care and services um, it just must feel awful um, to, when you're getting support and everybody's got all this on and you just, you know, there's just a stigma, I think, of, of dirty and clean. And that's definitely not the issue. It's, it's about protection for you and, 
and your attendance so we don't get people sick. I mean, we're we're so desperately short of PSWs and nurses and there's all these um, shortened abbreviated education opportunities now to try to get more of them out there. And I think we just got to keep people as uh, safe as, as we possibly can. Yeah, well, connected to that question, um, if someone is uh, does get sick, does get COVID-19, um, are there different protocols that should be put in place um, when people come, when PSWs come to support their care? Yeah, so, so there are guidance documents and um, they're referenced at the end of this um, uh, presentation. So your public health will have a guidance document if you live in the community, for example. And what that guidance document currently says is full PPE. So if you have COVID and I am coming as a care support person, I would have to have a glove, gown, mask, and eyewear when providing any care. And if there's an AGMP, I would have to wear an N95 for that. Great. They, and connected um, to that, uh, sorry, I've lost my spot. Um, would it be beneficial for consumers to also be wearing face masks when their PSWs are in the home? Absolutely. It's preferred according to public health, but some people can't for particular health reasons. And those could be psychological and or physical or a combination, but it absolutely is preferred. Okay, that's great. Um, there's a question about the new, the variants that are out there. Um, has there been any changes to how we should protect ourselves in public, knowing that there's variants right now? Great question. And it's, uh, we need to be even more diligent because they don't know the efficacy of the vaccines uh, purely against the variants, right? There's some, I found some research that I'm going to present in April um, about that, but I'm not finished um, collecting all my information yet, but um, it varies actually, Rebecca. So what they're saying is we need to be even more diligent. It's interesting that we're seeing a lot of our schools uh, closing again and going to online learning because of the variants. Um, and I know we have a very significant variant um, here in Ontario. Um, so we, we need to, they're saying, just be even more diligent. Um, I just want to step in. Uh, the, the whole part of us doing this fourth IPAC is for us to really be more diligent now with the variants being out there and I thank you Tim for really you know giving us the information so really um, follow the infection prevention control um, guidance in this workshop and the Ontario government really try to wear the proper PPE wash your hands and social distance so thank you thank you Tim go ahead go ahead Rebecca um there's a question. So as Tim mentioned before, and as John mentioned, we are going to be doing a webinar particularly about vaccines. Um, but there's a question, if, if you're staying home and are self-isolating, um, should you plan to get the vaccine if you're not going out? That's a great question. And, and it really is personal choice. Um, I would strongly encourage people um, to, to vaccinate. This is new for us. So, I mean, I've been in healthcare since 1979, uh, worked through SARS, um, and this is much bigger and, and much more serious than, than that was in my nursing opinion. And we don't, the herd immunity, I'm seeing anywhere from 40 to 70% of people needing to be vaccinated in order to get herd immunity. But remember that this is so new and that number could jump up to the same as measles, which is 95%. It, it's hard to tell. It's uh, If you were my loved one um, and somebody I cared for, I would encourage you. Um, I have a 
seven older brothers and my eldest brother is uh, 75. His children are all anti-medical and anti-vaxxers and anti-everything. I love my nephews and nieces, but they're just anti-everything. And I'm just crazy Uncle Tim the nurse. But um, he called me because he was scared and wanting to listen to his children. And then they'd sent him a whole lot of information from people who are saying not to get it and it's going to make you ill and it's going to destroy your immune system. And um, I just went by the information that I know and what vaccines do. And, and they, they really try to prevent that serious hospitalization, that serious risk. And remember, the more we fill up our ICU beds, now we don't have room for surgeries. And in the first wave, the second wave, people with cancer diagnoses were waiting because our hospitals were overloaded. And I can tell you, um, having worked in our hospital recently in the last five weeks, um, everybody's tired and exhausted and it's a scary place. It truly, in my humble opinion, it's not that people don't care. Um, it's just a, a scary place to be right now. And, and um, my heart goes out to everybody in those environments because it's, uh, it's a tough go and going into a third wave and thinking about all our healthcare providers there and in the community. And um, I think vaccines are, are the best option in my humble opinion, but it is just my opinion. Um, may I, uh, may I uh, sorry, David. Um, uh, I have basically uh, been home for the last year or so and only been out twice for fear of my immune compromised situation. And to answer the person's question, um, I'm not sure how many attendants they have in a week, but I have 20 attendants that come to me so if I get sick, it's because it's come from outside. And if you can't go outside to get the vaccine, you can call your local health integrated network, uh, your LIN, and ask your uh, case coordinator to get the EMS in your area to come and do a home uh, vaccination. It may take a little longer uh, than if you were to go in person but they could come to you if you're afraid of going out. So that, uh, just a little bit more information for people, so. Uh, sorry, David, go ahead. Of course. Uh, Tim. Yeah. You know, as we talk about vaccine hesitancy, and we know that um, there's been a lot of um, concerns around the AstraZeneca in terms of the risk of blood clotting. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some people who are already resistant to taking it. Um, can you talk a bit about the new study that showed on um, the efficacy and maybe the impact on reducing um, serious illnesses that came out of that study? I realize the vaccine is not, the, the workshop is not going to be for more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. Are you able to talk at all about that? or So the... I don't have the the full uh, for it's not in, in front of me, but it's in my head. David, somewhere stuck in here. Um, the Astra, so the the risk of blood clots. Um, they're thinking it was linked specifically to one particular um, uh, vat of the actual vaccine. So they think it was related to one sort of large. Um, I'm going to call it a vat for back of, lack of a better word um, of that vaccine. So that's where they think it came from and it was from a particular manufacturer so the the statistics um, are alarming when I researched it how small they actually are but it's you know it's the 80 20 rule David we, we talk more 80 percent more about the wrong things in our lives and 20 percent about the good things so I'm I just want to make sure I verify before I say anything that I've got accurate information David but the numbers um, from what I have researched so far, uh, blood clotting is a risk with any vaccination. It's it's a com it's a, a one of those uh, serious side effects, and our stats to date. But again, remember we're only talking about from January. Our stats to date um, are far less than what the normal statistics would be for any vaccine protocol. And there are lots of safety protocols from NACI that um, I'm I'm going to hopefully share with people in April that really gives them some information so they're more informed in their decision-making is what I'm hoping for. Thanks, Tim. I have uh, another mask-related question for you, Tim. Um, are there different sizes of procedural masks or are they one size fits all? That, 
in my uh, experience, it's one size fits all. That, that's a great question, but I, I've never seen um, small, medium, large. It's just, and I've worked in hospitals and community and um, where the different sizes are is the N95s. Okay. Because they have to fit your face for, as a seal, whereas procedure masks don't. Great, thank you. Um, there was a question early on about hand washing and the appropriate amount of time to be hand washing. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just re restate for us when we're washing our hands, how long we should be washing for. Sure, so an easy way to remember is sing happy birthday twice. That's an easy way or approximately 20 seconds with soap and water. If you're using ABHRs, you have to do it until your hands are completely dry. Otherwise, the efficacy of that hand wash is not 100%. Great, thank you. Um, I believe we've gotten through, uh, there, there are a few vaccine related questions. So John, I can I can move on to those, or we can save those for the vaccine workshop. Um, what would you prefer? Um, we can we can save them for the vaccine workshop. Are there any other questions? I think one came up, or um, uh, no. No, it was just a comment about someone having a very good experience going to get. Um, their Pfizer vaccine and that was uh, feeling good about the medical staff there following all the protocols. So that's wonderful. Awesome, great to hear. Great. Always nice to hear when, when protocols are being followed and it's not a stressor. <laughs> exactly, yes. So what I would like to do is then um, go to some of the resources that Tim has put together um, you can always get more information from Health Canada about routine practices, uh, how to prevent transmission. Um, Health Canada has a number of really good web links that I'm going to be sharing with everyone after the webinar. Um, there's also at the provincial level and how to also put on the medical isolation gowns as well to see those videos again. I find them extremely informative. Uh, you know, I have actually shared it with my service provider. They only take, you know, one minute each and it's extremely useful. Uh, I found that some of my PSWs were taking off their gowns or actually putting on their gowns over their head and told them that's not proper practice. <laughs> and so having that visual was so great. Um, so, um, additionally, uh, these are, are the Public Health Agency of Canada is the main site where you go to get most of your health related information and they have a lot of stuff on COVID. Same with Public Health Ontario, um, IPAC Canada, and there's also the CDC guidance of use of personal protective equipment. Um, there's also more information on medical masks and respirators, uh, and also information about the coronavirus from the World Health Organization. Um, so there's a number of resources that will be sent to everybody, um, and um, just to get to this particular slide, it's about, you know, where you can purchase PPE. The Ontario government has a website um, where they have a list of companies. And once again, we, as a disclaimer, this listing is compiled by SILT for information purposes only. SILT so does not recommend or endorse these companies. And that's also stated by the Ontario government. But these are places where you can find if there's PPE uh, locally in Ontario. They list a whole bunch of different companies for Ontario. 
and also um, the direct funding program has put together some consumer validated PPE suppliers and the link is there and will be sent to everyone. Um, there's also some stores that we've used or uh, are aware of, uh, Starkman's Medical Supply, Maxell Express, Canadian, Great Canadian Supplies, and Northern Surgical Medical Supplies. And um, so the resources that are gonna be sent out are this PowerPoint, uh, the PPE resources, uh, as well as the, the PPE suppliers and the resources that Tim has put together. I am also going to be within the next 24 hours sending out the handouts as well as the Zoom recording for everyone and also um, um, the webinar link to our April 7 vaccine workshop for you to register if you're interested. I sent it out in the previous reminder email, but I'll send it out again as part of this package, as well as an accessible Word document of this PowerPoint in large print. And um, I want to pass it to Rebecca to ask some evaluation questions so we could get your feedback. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, we are going to put up some evaluation questions and I apologize to those on the phone. Uh, polling is not a useful phone option, but if you'd like to send us an email with feedback, um, we would really appreciate it. So this first poll is gonna appear on your screen and you can select your answer. The question is, did the workshop expand your knowledge of infection prevention and control? And once you've selected your answer, you click submit and that will send your answer to me. So I will give everyone a few seconds to do that. And once again, your answers are anonymous. So just for an FYI. And I'll just give it a few more seconds. And I will end the polling in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And the next question. Do you feel more confident in using IPAC practices to reduce your risk of exposure in daily life? And again, once you've put in your answer, you can hit submit. And I'll close the polling in five, four, three, two, one. Our next question, was the information easy to follow? Please answer the questions with the number you feel applies.
All right, I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and were the resources presented today useful? Please answer and put a uh, hit submit. Okay, I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. And our last question is about um, participant information. So if you could answer which one of these categories fits you best, that's really helpful for us to know um, who's accessing our workshops um, and as we're planning in the future, all of this feedback is really helpful to make sure we're, we're planning and programming things that are useful for our community. All right, we'll just give it a few more seconds. And if you leave today with, uh, you know, walk away and have more quest but questions, please feel free to get in touch anytime and we will follow up. Uh, the Center for Independent Living in Toronto is a resource center and we are always happy to put together resources and referrals for folks. All right, I'm gonna end this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for your time and participation. I want to thank Tim for this excellent presentation. I want to thank uh, the ASL interpreters, Sean and Kate, and Sarah the captioner. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your your, your time and your efforts. Uh, I want to thank um, Wendy Porter, our executive director, Lisa DeBono, the direct funding manager, David Myers, um, our senior manager, and Rebecca Wood for assisting in the facilitation of this workshop. Um, this last slide is you can contact SILT with any inquiries or you can contact him if you have any questions for him. And once again, I will be sending out this PowerPoint, the resources, the link to the recording, so you can have a reference for it. And also the next workshop on April 7th, if you wish to register. So once again, I thank everybody and thank you, Tim. Thanks guys, take care. Thank you. We can stop recording now. <laughs>